Guys, and today we're going to continue with the color tracking tutorial that we started. This is part two where we're going to look at actually tracking the video output that we ended with last time. Before we, s so if you haven't already looked at part one, I suggest you go back and look at it. And this is the sort of stage you should be at so we can bring our video, click our the color we want, and it will then start to track it. And then depending on the threshold that we pass through. Depends on how, how how well it tracks that specific colour. Before we move on and start looking at the second section that we're going to develop over here, hence the big space, I'm going to do some quick tidying up on our patch here. Now I'm going to get rid of these three P windows just because we don't need them and all they do is use up CPU power. I'm going to stack all these on top of each other just to neaten up a bit. And then put that there, bring that there, and then we can make this a wee bit bigger. I'm going to move my sucker and my second P window up. And what I'm going to do is after this, so we added this bang here so that when someone picks a colour, it sends a bang. But what you find with sometimes is that it, because <coughs> as you click this, both this and these messages bang at the same time. So all this bang does is it, it forces this message to go into our ABS differential up here. Uh, ABS difference, I should say. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to add a delay here to make sure that this message is updated properly uh, before we actually bang it. So all I'm going to do is a 10 millisecond delay and that just means that this processor has enough time to run it through the prepin zero prepin value and then generate the message before we bang it. And that means that no matter what happens, the value will always be updated to the color that you're trying to press. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm also going to add a what we call a load message. So every time that the patch is opened, it sends out a special bang. So uh, like when we click a color, it bangs this message into uh, this value here. We're going to bang 25 into this top integer value here. And all that means is every time we load the patch, our uh, threshold is already set to a 25 negative and that's the general sort of sweet spot that I found through the f years or sort of few few real life developments that I've, I've messed about with this tracker and a bit more of a sort of usefulness I'm going to make our color selector a bit bigger and remember all you need to do is match this sucker to that as well uh, bring these down here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select everything and I'm going to go to it's Shift Command Y. Shift Command Y and that will route our patch cards and all that means is the Macs will work out where to link them up so that they don't cross over any other nodes and you can see here we've now got a completely clean screen and having it slightly bigger just makes it easy to push everything. Uh, tidying up out of the way what we're going to do is move on to actually implementing the, the tracking system into the patch. In the example that I showed at the start of part one, that used a separate aftermarket blob tracker. But Max has all the power we need to do it uh, internally, and that's what we're going to look at here today. So what we're going to do is use the great resource that is Max itself to bring in some some pre-made nodes. So we're going to do JIT dot find bounds, open up its reference, and you'll see here we have uh, a few videos playing, lots of patching cards and send receive nodes and then a flickering square. Now what this is doing, the jet.find bounds, it outputs some values 
that relate to the top left and bottom right hand corner of this box. You can see they're constantly changing. And the values it's looking for in terms of these locations are through these min and max, which the minimum value it's looking for is nothing, so pure black. And the maximum value it'll look for is, in this case, it runs alpha, red, green, blue, but in, in the floating point variable, so it's looking for our sort of orangey colors. And you can see here it's focusing on the ball and the boy's arms. Now this is gold for us is exactly what we want. And all we've done is made a patch that is picking out the exact color so our square will be much stronger. So I'm going to control C, close, and we can delete this and then I'm going to paste and make sure you drag it out of the way before you deselect it. So what we have here is almost an exact copy of our original patch just minus the tracking system. So all we need to do is implement it. And you can see this goes into the movie source. So I'm just going to move this over into our movie source. We can delete that. I don't need another frames per second. This is a trigger, just in case you're unfamiliar with it. All the trigger does is it's like a router in your house. It has the same signal to a lot of different places. So trigger uh, the T stands for trigger, followed by lots of different characters. Well then, uh, so if we look at the example, you can see it can deal with a bang, integer, float, list, or anything, basically. Uh, so in this case, we have it will match up perfectly. So in our one, anytime it gets a clear message, so if I change the file, it naturally sends out a clear message and starts the new one. It will send that out the third channel, so that all the videos after they're clear and all the values go away. And then LL stands for lists, or in this case matrix. And the matrix goes to two places. Uh, it goes to this s.bounds, and it also goes to the jit.find bounds. The way s.bounds works is this is called a send and receive node link up. And these are like patching cards without the patching cards. It's almost like a wireless box without the need for a, a, a wired internet connection. So S, short for send, links up with its matching receive node. So you can see here, if I double click it, I get send bounds, receive bounds, and it'll highlight them for me. We can do the exact same if we just uh, drag this card if I can get it, if we drag this over into here where it goes and then delete receive, the exact same thing is happening. I'm just going to root that so it's a bit neater for us. <coughs> and then I'm going to do the same with this RMX and RMN, which just sounds for receive minimum, receive maximum, which is going to come from this uh, min-max setup that we've got here. I'm going to delete that, I'm going to delete that, and then down here you can see we've got smx, smn, delete, delete. We can now delete s-bounds and drag our clear message into the matrix as well. And then I don't think we need to do much else. Instead of this going straight into jet find bounds, so which is just the matrix, this is the section that we're going to run through all our calculations. So then that comes down here. We can then adjust this so it is below that. I'm going to command a control shift Y to root all the patch cards a bit later. And you can see here we've now got our bo uh, the exact replica of our video playing in here. And that's because our min and maximum aren't set yet. Now, we only have a video that contains two, two variables. We've got alpha and then we've got our color. So we don't need the, R, uh, the G and B essentially of this one. So I'm just going to shorten that so it's not confusing. In terms of these values, they don't really matter. All we need to do is tell it that we're looking for A, a colour. So I'm going to set this to 0.5, that means it's going to look for anything. And then that colour also needs to have an alpha channel. 
minimum is going to be the exact same. It also needs to have a minimum alpha channel because our video is either on or off. It's not, not a scalable transparency. So as you can see, just by having any value in here, it's going to instantly start tracking what we're working with. And it's got no minimum color because it doesn't really matter. So <coughs> one, one is looking for anything with an alpha channel that is any color. And it needs to have an alpha channel and it doesn't matter what color it is, that's, that's what we're passing to find bounds here. And so if I click the whole thing, it's looking for any color. And if we track the ball, you can see that it's very accurately putting a square around it. And that is why it's so powerful to narrow down our exact individual color we want. If we look at an example like O, if we look at the blue, you'll see that it averages over the space. So you're getting a bit of this, which is almost cross-contamination. Whereas you're still getting a very nice track, whereas things like his chin comes up, it's more bluey than skinny under there because it's quite a dark shadow. Our box is lowering its dimensions. The reality of it is though, we don't actually need that. It's This is all just a visual representation. Where the actual important information is, if we go back to ball for now, if it's so easy to use, are these here. So these are outputting the X and Y of the top left and the X and Y of the bottom right. And then in between here, all it's doing is it's creating a box using the source dimensions for this and that. It's, it's like drawing a rectangle using this X, Y, that X, Y. Pausing the video probably would have been better to explain it. So now you have your minimum coordinates, your maximum coordinates. We can start finding out the average of these. So if we do the, if you do the quick mass, so 297 take away uh, 258, 39. So this box is 39 pixels across. 39 divided by 2 is, is 19.5. And here's the center somewhere. So 258 plus 19.5. The center point of our circle is in pixel 278. So around here. And the exact same. How do we get Max to do that for us? Fairly simple. Early in the first. In the first part one, we used an expression here, which is how we do simple maths, but there is actually things like plus and minus, mm. minus nodes already. So all we want to do is we want to plus number one, oh, no we don't, we want to minus number two from number one. And what's that's going to give us? Uh, we need to send a bang message to make it update. And like with all things in Max, only the first only receiving a bang message in the first input will cause it to update. So it's simply by adding this uh, nice little uh, button onto the output for the right hand channel it just means that it will, it will constantly update so now what's this we're getting we're getting the difference that the difference between the far edge and the close edge and then we're going to use an X, XPR our value, so just dollar sign i1 divided by 2. And I'm not going to use a floating point here, so it, it will use integer and it will automatically round it up. And I know that's working, so I can get rid of that test there. And then I'm just going to duplicate this, so select it all over. So now we've got that, all we need is a final plus, and we add the plus to this, add our i, 
and the reason we add it to the left hand one because we want to add we're, we're taking the difference dividing by 2 and then adding it to the original value so you're we're getting the difference divided by 2 and then adding it to the side so we know exactly where the center is j.find bounds it's giving us minimum maximum pounds for the area of the color we're tracking and now we're finding the dead center point of it what we're going to do in part 3 is we're going to look at ways we can actually use that value so these center values to start doing fun stuff